Hello everybody and welcome to Drydock episode 136. This week the questions are taken from guide 197 on the Diana or Palada class of protected cruisers and the Wednesday video on the bombardment of Ancona by the Austro-Hungarian Navy. Information Mimic asks, why did the guns on protected cruisers often have no protection? For the most part on protected cruisers, the main battery, and sometimes if there was one, a secondary battery, would have some form of protection. Um, you can see here, for example, on HMS Falmouth, and also in the original video this question was taken from on the Diana, dash Palada dash Aurora that the guns do have a degree of protection in the form of gun shields they're usually open backed so they're not turrets or mounts they are gun shields but the admittedly the shields themselves are not exactly the thickest uh, of protection the reason for that is a combination of weight and damage calculations weight because if you're going to put a much heavier uh, amount of protection on it, i.e. a very heavy shield or some form of turret, then that's going to take the gun beyond the capability of simple hand operations. You're going to need much more complex machinery, which increases weight even further, which means fewer guns and more effects on stability, which is not a good thing overall. Um, Especially when you consider that a lot of these ships were built in a period where these sort of small, quick-firing, rapid-tracking guns were the primary reason for these ships' construction in the first place. But that aside, when it comes to what degree of protection you actually give them, having ruled that out, the gun shields are effectively there for splinter protection only. And the reason for that is that even at this kind of small scale 4, 4.1, 5.9, 6 inch, etc. guns, the amount of steel that you would need to stop an incoming shell completely, i.e. so the crew behind it would be absolutely fine, is far too thick, again, for the number and type and maneuverability of guns that are needed. So... Once you've acknowledged that you can't practically stop a direct hit to the gun or near enough to the gun, then you have to think about, OK, what can we protect against? If you make it as thick as you can whilst retaining the number of guns, etc. that you need, then you are just creating a source of splinters. So if you, say, put an inch and a half of plate on there and you get hit by a six inch high explosive shell, the chances are all you've done is create a bunch of free shrapnel for that shell to spray on your gun crew, which is going to definitely kill the gun crew. Whereas if it's thinner, then a direct hit might pass through and go on somewhere else into the ship to explode. Or at absolute worst, if it does penetrate and then explode in and around the gun, at least the explosion is only going to be throwing out the shrapnel of the shell itself and the explosive power of the shell itself without additional help from the gun shield. So some people might survive, whereas that goes down with with the alternate scenario. If you just have splinter protection, it obviously means that if a shell hits elsewhere, the gun crew are still protected from the splinters, which is a good thing. Um, that keeps them alive from anything basically but a direct hit. And as I said, you can't really help too much against those at this scale. And also the other end of the weight equation is that if you only go for splinter protection, then it means that you can fit more guns on your ship as compared to someone who goes for heavier protection. And if you have more guns on your ship, especially in the late 19th, early 20th century cruiser warfare, the chances are you're going to be more likely to hit your opponent first and thus cripple or destroy their ship first which hopefully will render the need for any kind of protection on your ship's guns somewhat less because you're not going to be being hit anywhere near as much or as often because you've taken out the enemy first. Gail Lim asks, Why did the New York-class battleships use triple expansion engines when the Floridas and Wyomings had already used turbines? Did the US have a bad experience with the turbine engines? <laughs> 
At the time, the US Navy was receiving various criticisms from its various paymasters, including Congress, about being too experimental and wanting to push the boat out too far on too many things. So in some places, like say with the 14-inch gun, the US Navy was pushing ahead, but in other places it tried to be as conservative as possible, if for no other reason than to sort of immediately fend off some of the criticisms. What that meant was that when they put out contracts for new battleships uh, or proposals for designs of new battleships, they would say, OK, we would prefer turbine engines now because they are the future. However, if you can prove that you can do as good or better with a reciprocating engine, i.e. a vertical triple expansion engine, we'll look at that as well. The US, unlike almost everybody else, had to factor in range quite massively to their calculations because as i've said before the british had multiple coaling stations all over the planet even though they did have to go long distances the japanese were generally interested in their own backyard the germans likewise whereas the americans to get anywhere that wasn't canada or mexico had to travel across an ocean and those were oceans where they didn't have any, really any coaling stations and the Pacific's big enough even if you do have Pearl Harbor in some way shape or form at least as a coaling station. So with this additional emphasis on range the US Navy was faced with one slight issue which is that whilst turbines were much much better than uh, triple expansion engines for top speed and running smoothly at top speed and running at top speed for considerable amounts of time before the invention of the turbine and the subsequent expansion of that technology into and distribution of it into various ships across various navies there really wasn't any way to get around the fact that at cruising speed a direct drive turbine was significantly more fuel inefficient than a vertical triple expansion engine and given that the New York or Texas class was already pushing the boat out with much greater size, new emphasis on long-range fire, 14-inch guns, etc., etc., and analysis of some of the uh, earlier ships like the Wyoming's had shown that actually the, there was a significant drop-off in overall fuel efficiency and thus range for a given amount of fuel and power installed, there was a breakthrough with triple expansion engines that was forced lubrication. Now this forced lubrication came about significantly after the introduction of turbines into various fleets, but it did hold a kind of end of the design life cycle advantage in that it removed some, not all, but some of the issues with running vertical triple expansion engines at high RPM to get up to a top speed. And so the US Navy decided that although the VTE was considered to be an, an almost expired technology, they would adopt it in these particular ships in order to get back the range that they'd lost by doing earlier turbine-powered uh, ships. And whilst, yes, it wouldn't necessarily be kind of a, a technology that would last all that well all that long... You've got to bear in mind that at the time you're talking about an era which has seen probably from the 1890 period onward, so at, at this point for 20 years, ships going from new to launch, on launch to second line to obsolete well within the space of 10 to 15 years. So the fact that this technology might not be really all that great a decade or two down the line didn't really matter too much because a decade or two down the line these ships would have been replaced anyway and indeed i mean if you compare the capabilities of a new york class battleship to what would theoretically have come down the slipway just over a decade later in the terms of the south dakota class battleship of the 1920s you can see pretty much what their reasoning was it's just that the Washington Naval Treaty then meant everything had to stay around a lot longer than everyone had actually thought it would and you ended up with all the various problems and issues arising um, as a result of the VTE power plant later on in the 1920s and 30s.
Josh Thomas Moore asks, which nation of the three navies had the best names for their warships? That is always going to be a very loaded question, because, well, names for ships sometimes can fall into the category of what I would call universal names, i.e. names that everybody can either just immediately on seeing the translation or with the, a slight bit of knowledge of the general culture see are really cool names. Other names can be intellectually understood as good, sort of cool for the navy in question, and you can see why they chose them, but don't have much resonance, particularly outside of that country. So, I mean, for example, if France launches a battleship called France, or Paris, then, or Paris, I guess, that's going to have a lot of resonance with French people, and you can understand intellectually why that would happen. But for someone from another country, it's not really going to do all that much. And the same thing, a German ship called Deutschland. Great for the Germans, and everyone else is like, well, OK, it's named after your country, what's the big deal? Um, whereas something that has a more universal appeal will be seen as cooler on instinctive levels. So that's the kind of... The point I'm trying to get across is just because I'm listing particular ships in a couple of major navies from the free navies, that doesn't mean I don't understand why people named things the way they did. It's just that it resonates more particularly with them rather than with the general populace. For example, the Dutch and their habit of calling practically everything de Reuter. <laughs> Yeah, we, we know why. <laughs> uh, but anyway, for free navies with the best names for their warships, I'm kind of split between the Norwegian and Polish navies. The Polish navy had a habit of naming a lot of its destroyers, particularly, and other ships as well, but destroyers especially, after things like thunder, lightning, hurricane, etc. So you can see like, that's a really cool name to have generally, but especially for something like a destroyer that's supposed to be swift and devastating. So they immediately get up there with, with the very cool names. The reason the Norwegians are in the running is they have some similar naming conventions, but they also name an awful lot of their ships, at least from the World War II period, after elements from Norwegian mythology. And again, this is very much kind of probably a westernised perspective on things because whilst the Polish concept of like thunder, lightning, um, thunderstorm, etc., that can probably be understood worldwide. Something like Odin or Thor, or Thor in the Norwegian case, Sleipnir, etc., those are cool to the Norwegians for obvious reasons, they're really cool and interesting to a lot of people in Western culture who are aware of Norse mythology, especially since a lot of the Norwegian ships, whilst they did draw on the Norse pantheon generally, they also did seem to go into kind of the Ragnarok kind of mythology for some of the names, which ties everything in, obviously, being quite dramatic. But if you said to... Um, I don't know, someone from the Japanese Navy, oh, this this is H, uh, the Norwegian ship Odin that's probably going to have a not tremendous level of impact on them unless they have to be a student of Norse mythology. But from my personal perspective, it is kind of a tie break between the Norwegian and Polish navies. David S. Cameron asks, why is the Union flag flying in many pictures of this Russian cruiser? This is from the Diana Dash Palada video and other Russian ships. Now, I must admit, this was something that actually puzzled me for quite a while when I was looking at black and white photos of Imperial Russian ships, um, even going as far as into the early period of this channel. Because, as you say, yeah, look at a black and white photo of a Russian ship. This is the uh, front deck of the Aurora, for example, and you think, hang on, that, that's the Union Jack. Or close enough to it, especially when it's not as big and clear as it is in here. What the heck is the Union Jack doing flying off of a Russian warship? But, as it turns out, appearances can be deceiving. Uh, no, I haven't colorized this photo. This is actually a photo I took when I was on the Aurora 
in the early 2000s and I just put it through a black and white filter for effect earlier. As you can see, it's not actually the Union Jack. Um, it is, in fact, almost color-wise, almost a reverse of the Union Jack. This is one of the Imperial Russian Navy's main battle flags or ensigns or jacks, if you, depending on where it is exactly on the ship and what size of the of flag it is, happens to be. So, yeah, this is one of the issues where black and white photos can be slightly deceptive because, as you saw with the black and white filter applied, it can look an awful lot like Union Jack, and especially if it's more sort of folded up, ruffled, much smaller in the picture overall, you can be very easily deceived into thinking that it is, and then you have to start coming up with all sorts of rationalizations as to why this ship is flying the Union Jack. The fact that a number of Russian warships in the 1918, 1919, 1920 period actually did end up temporarily in one way, shape or form in the hands of the Royal Navy doesn't actually help. Um, but for the most part, the flag you're seeing is actually going to be this one, which is actually a Russian one. Beyond the overly excessively enslaved Singaporean, possibly needs our help, but also asks, did the unashalan turrets of all dreadnoughts that had them cause damage to all of the ships? i.e. Kaiser, Invincible, Indefatigable, Molka, Von der Tan, Sadlitz, Neptune, Colossus, Espania, and potentially more. A qualified yes, in as much as it was possible for the N Echelon turrets to cause damage to pretty much any ship that had them, with a strong emphasis on possible. It depended very, very much on the ship in question. A good example, um, for instance, is here. So you've got the Minas Gerais class, the Brazilian dreadnoughts. Now you can see immediately how the relatively close spacing of those turrets both to each other and the superstructure and funnels in general could cause some issues with blast damage even in the most perpendicular of cross deck fire. But if you look at the Rivadavia class, the Argentinian ships that were designed and built a few years later, you can see that here the uh, echelon turrets are much more spaced out, both relative to each other and the general superstructure. So a full-on 90 degree broadside from a river Davia is relatively unlikely to cause major blast effect damage as compared to something like a Minas Gerais class or an Invincible class battlecruiser or something along those lines. Now, there are still going to be limitations when it comes to this. A perfect 90 degree or perpendicular cross deck firing is one thing. The more and more the target shifts to off of that alignment, the more and more you end up with the potential for damage from the blast. Similar to how even with ships using purely centerline batteries, if you crank the turret all the way around so they're all pointing as far aft as they'll go, and still all point at a target or all the way forward, there will be the risk of blast damage along the side of the vessel. But with the N echelon turrets, that degree of turn is significantly more limited than it is with the fore or aft turrets, assuming that those turrets have been placed relatively sensibly. So for some ships, they can engage in cross deck firing at close to perpendicular angles without much concern about blast effects, although there will still be some minor issues. Other ships, even if they do straight cross-deck firing, will have damage problems. And yeah, the Spaniards, the uh, Invincibles, etc. would fall under that kind of category. Others, it would be a case of if the target's particularly off angle, then yeah, there could be a problem, but generally not so much. Seppo Kanjanti asks, in regards to cross deck fire, were there technical difficulties in designing ships with many centerline turrets, or was it a matter of doctrine, i.e. some end on fire without compromising broadside weight? If it was all a matter of the engineering, then how on earth did they arrive at ships like the Fusos or HMS Agincourt, and what workarounds did they have to incorporate? It varies, again, quite considerably from ship to ship, so there's a mixture of factors. For some ships, like, say, HMS Dreadnought, it was purely a design consideration informed by doctrine. Um, as I covered in one of the videos about um, all big gun designs, one of the almost front-runner designs for Dreadnought did involve turrets all on the centerline. 
and give, gave the same ex effective broadside of eight guns, but Fisher was determined to have his theoretical end on fire, and so yeah, went with that. But outside of doctrine issues, there were sometimes also technical issues. A lot of that was to do with the machinery. Within a given size of ship, especially early on, if you wanted to get up to a certain speed, you needed a certain amount of machinery. That machinery took up space, um, and if that machinery took up too much space, then you couldn't get as many turrets all the way down the center line as you theoretically could if you put a couple of them in echelon. So you can see that here, for example, with HMS Colossus. Now, in theory, you can probably see that either by slightly rearranging the superstructure or slightly rearranging that center funnel or some other form of a very slight variation, you could quite happily fit a centerline turret in that space, similar to how they put centerline turrets in the British 13.5-inch gunships. And that would give you an all-centerline arrangement with an eight-gun broadside. However, you can also see that that kind of space that you've got free to play with if you shuffle that turret around a bit, or sorry, shuffle the funnel around a bit, isn't going to be quite enough to fit two turrets in which means that if you go on echelon then because you can get them offset to each other very slightly in theory you can now have a 10 gun broadside with some limitations admittedly you could also just shuffle everything back and put a, another gun turret forward or make the ship slightly longer but that involves rather radical design changes that would vastly increase the cost of the ship so this kind of approach of, yeah, we could just have a lighter and more efficient layout with fewer guns on the overall broadside, or we could go with a slightly heavy, slightly less inefficient layout, but on certain angles, we actually have more guns on the broadside. So, and obviously this is for a given size of ship, which may be dictated by various concerns. If you just make the ship longer, you can just fit lots and lots of turrets in a row which is in some ways what they did with Agincourt, but never mind. The other aspect of why you get ships like the Fusos, the Agincourts, um, some American ships like Utah and Arkansas and such like, is machinery is advancing quite quickly. So this concern about how much space the machinery is taking up, and bearing in mind it's not just top deck space for the turret to turn around, it's also below deck space where the magazine and the barbette have to penetrate and there may well be machinery down there. When you see things like the Helgelands and the Nassaus with their hexagonal layout, that is in part because of the choice of sticking with vertical triple expansion engines and that just taking up so much room there physically isn't the space to put turrets on the center line. Once you've switched to turbine engines, you've got a little bit more space, but you're still using various models of boilers and such that are somewhat less efficient so you have this kind of cross deck firing solution but as technology improves and also to be perfectly honest ships get somewhat larger you end up in circumstances where the amount of machinery has reduced um, in terms of footprint that you can now get more guns on the center line and also because ships have just gotten bigger you can also fit more gun turrets on them at all period which in the end, makes up for an all center line approach becoming much, much more viable, especially if you remember in an era when practically everyone is using twin turrets. So any substantial increase in firepower means adding one or more additional turrets, as opposed to, you know, triple turrets where you can get a nine gun broadside for three turrets instead of an eight gun broadside for four. And that's why you kind of see this technological progress happening very quickly. Some navies never go in for the cross-firing solution. Um, they just go with longer ships or accept uh, somewhat less firepower. But you can see, for example, in the British and German navies that the in the British case, the last generation 12-inch ships, in the German case, the second to last generation 12-inch ships, because they stick with 12-inch guns for slightly longer, have cross-deck firing capability, but that is then taken out and replaced with 
all centerline turrets for the last generation of German 12-inch ships and the British 13.5-inch ships, where they now have a 10-gun broadside, which is theoretically the same as the previous generation, except now that that 10-gun broadside is laid out much better because they're only using one turret in the amidships instead of two in echelon and that turret can actually range out at much greater angles on either side than the in echelon ones ever could next we have what year outside of during a major war did the british spend the most as a percent of gdp on the royal navy in terms of the absolute history of the Royal Navy, it's almost certainly going to be some point in the Age of Sail, probably in the late 18th century, maybe the early 19th century, or perhaps even earlier, because in those days um, the GDP of the country was a lot lower and the government spending was not as diverse. Whereas, on the other hand, working out exactly what those percentages are it gets a lot more difficult for those periods. If you want to look at, say, the ironclad era forwards, then you're probably actually looking at, by all the figures I can work out, about 1937, which is in the run-up to a major war, but it's not actually a major war itself. UK defence spending as a percent of GDP is higher in 1938 and 1939 than it is in 1937, but naval spending specifically seems to have been a greater proportion of that in 1937 uh, as opposed to 38 or 39 which to be fair is like three quarters non-war period so i'm going to go for 1937 as a rough estimate although um it wouldn't surprise me that maybe something like 1908 1909 might edge it one way or the other but it's it's still, even at this period, somewhat difficult to determine the exact figures, and by at least the calculation methods that I use, 37 seem to come out just a fraction higher than the 1908-1909. UNSC Forward on to Dawn asks, Suppose the Austrian fleet had sortied in early 1915 before Italy joined the war to try and disrupt the Anglo-French operations at the Dardanelles. Could they have achieved anything, or would it just have been a suicide charge? It would not have gone well for the Austro-Hungarian Navy. Whilst, in theory, they would have three out of the four Tegethoff class in commission, so they've got three dreadnoughts, even if you include every single notionally pre-dreadnought class battleship that they've got and assume that they're all operational at the same time, so that goes all the way down to the Habsburgs, you've got nine pre-dreadnought battleships plus your three dreadnought so you've got a total of 12 ships and to be perfectly honest at least half of those have a significant disadvantage versus even the average pre-dreadnought if they go up against the allied fleet that's sitting off the dardanelles at the beginning of 1915 well the french alone have just over half a dozen pre-dreadnought battleships there the british have turned up with around about two dozen capital ships Granted, most of them are pre-dreadnoughts, but any one of them is significantly more capable than the Habsburgs and arguably the Ursus of Karls. The Radzetskis are probably, at least on paper, an even match, but when you add together the British and French forces, even if you, under some weirdly optimistic condition, give every single one of the French pre-dreadnoughts a one-to-one -one equivalence, they're still outnumbered three-to-one. And you think, oh, well, what about the Tegethoffs? Well, yeah, there are three Tegethoffs. There's also, well, there's HMS Inflexible there. Okay, she's a battle cruiser. Probably not necessarily a straight up match for the Tegethoffs. But there's also HMS Queen Elizabeth there, who is more than a match for any one of the Tegethoffs. And granted, I say, yes, there are three of them. But it's at best 12 ships versus almost 30. So, yeah. The cruisers and destroyers, it's kind of somewhat irrelevant given those odds, but given the fact that you'd have to sail down the Adriatic and across half the Mediterranean to get to the Dardanelles, the Allies are going to have plenty of warning that you're coming. 
and I just don't see any way that it's not going to end horrifically badly for the Austro-Hungarian fleet. Granted, they may well inflict casualties, but there's there's not many ways in which they're coming out of this in any condition other than sunk. Arthur Vakowski asks, Why do cruisers exist? What purpose do they serve? And why are there so many variations and types of them? Why didn't they go extinct once the dreadnought was invented? The answer is actually partly in the question when you talk about them so many different variants and roles basically cruisers exist to fill all those weird variants and roles when you look at how cruisers were developed as a formal class as opposed to just the designation for a ship that was assigned to a specific mission so you're looking at the 1880s onwards cruisers at that point served mainly for commerce protection commerce raiding depending on which side of the equation you were on as well as sort of fleet flagships for over long distance overseas stations basically roles that you needed a largish ocean going ship to fulfill but didn't demand a battleship given that battleships at this point were getting quite expensive and therefore there were relatively fewer of them as opposed to in the age of sail where you could have plenty of third and fourth rates to do a lot of these jobs but even then back in those days you had a lot of frigates as well and the cruiser kind of straddles the role of sometimes the third rate ship of the line more often the fifth and sixth rate frigate in the age of sail they were also used as scouts to form the fleet screen the jeu de col briefly suggested they might be a useful ancillary to the battle line itself then that went away again and it was back to the other roles then as destroyers and torpedo boats came into play they became very useful at taking out those destroyers and torpedo boats and obviously sticking with the battle fleet uh, due to their range long enough to protect the fleet wherever it went as opposed to uh, being only able to work with the fleet at short range the way that destroyers and torpedo boats could then you had a kind of much greater emphasis on the on-station convoy protection duties for surface raiders, on-station duties at various overseas flag showing stations like the China Station or um, the South Atlantic or something like that. Then as time went on you got to the Washington Treaty and whilst cruisers at that point are still never going to fight in the battle line because the gap between them and battleships has grown even larger ironically enough they actually have even more of a purpose as frontline sort of top end combatants themselves because the washington treaty has limited the numbers of battleships whilst not actually putting any limit on the numbers of cruisers which means that it's entirely possible under the interwar period with the treaty restrictions to have multiple engagements as indeed did in fact occur during the second world war where heavy cruisers were the flagships of both sides and there was not a battleship to be seen for hundreds of miles in any direction so this is where you kind of see the the 10,000 ton plus eight inch cruisers and then the six inch cruisers come in as quick fire rounds uh, quick fire uh, guns take over and you see that entering into the Second World War with cruisers now having a major surface combatant role in and of themselves in addition to the scouting role which has been to a certain extent partly taken over by large destroyers, radar and aircraft as well as the anti-destroyer role especially for the six inch cruisers and then latterly an anti-aircraft escort role as well. So cruisers fit all sorts of wonderful and interesting roles that aren't strictly the front battle line or something that a short range vessel like a destroyer can manage Kristen asks did the 50 us destroyers sent to britain in the ships for bases deal materially contribute to britain's fight against the u-boats yes quite considerably and in a number of different ways whilst their origin as fleet destroyers meant they weren't necessarily the most ideal platforms for anti-submarine warfare efforts they were at least available anti-submarine warfare hulls in a period when there really weren't that many period and of course they had a higher top speed uh, more capacity and a slightly longer range than a lot of the very earliest models of ships that were being thrown in as escorts so although they weren't ideal 
they were still considerably better than a lot of the alternatives. But it's not just their direct anti-submarine hunting role in which they assisted. A number of them were also used in other subsidiary roles that displaced other vessels from those roles, which in turn were somewhat better for use in convoy escort work, which helped. And of course, they kind of held the line until large numbers of mass-produced corvettes and sloops could come in and destroy escorts and frigates, etc., and take over the job from them. And then once they were largely displaced from the convoy escort role in kind of around about 1943-ish, then they were very useful in a number of subsidiary roles, some of which were involved in completely different parts of naval service, but others, such as tender ships for escorts, submarines, that kind of thing, were actually directly or slightly indirectly but still related to the Battle of the Atlantic and the fight against the U-boats. So by relieving other ships of their responsibilities in certain areas, by supporting the general activities that were required to support convoys, as well as by direct convoy escort, those destroyers did actually have a fairly important role to play. Uh, plus, of course, the uh, sacrifice of what at the time was HMS Campbelltown to keep the Tirpitz from having any possibility of really operating in the Atlantic meant that the battle in the Atlantic became a somewhat easier to resolve issue in terms of what kinds of escort forces and therefore what kind of priorities in terms of what ships needed to be built could be placed within UK shipyards. MG asks, your opinion of how BT and Jellicoe handled Jutland is known? <laughs> yeah, I think so by now. Uh, but how would you rate Hipper and Shear's effectiveness as commanders in this battle? Hipper, I think, generally did very well in the battle. I mean, as you know, as I've said before, I think he pretty much won the battle against BT. The Really, the only two things you can, I think, seriously fault Hipper for are both relatively minor. The first of which is during the initial phase of the fight against BT, the Germans, well, both sides actually start off out of effective gunnery range and then they close in and, as we know, B, um, BT misjudges the range and the Germans end up actually being able to fire pretty much around the same time as the British. In fact, the Germans get the first few shots in. But that was pretty much an unexpected side effect of BT's mistake and indeed the German ship set are recorded as having people board saying well, we were expecting to be fired on and we weren't so if he'd been fired on possibly he would have made some kind of different course change tried to close the range down quicker or whatever but the fact that Hipper al allowed his forces to gently drift through that period where the British theoretically could have been firing on him and he couldn't have fired back is probably a small fault of command a relatively minor one and then overlooked by the fact that you know it ended up not mattering the only other one was again somewhat understandable in that he was perhaps a little bit too reluctant to give up Lutzau um, and head off to find another ship to command from now granted he didn't make the cardinal mistake that BT did at say Dogger Bank of trying to continue to command from uh, the Lutzau, even well after it was crippled, once he left the ship, he let his subordinates control the first scouting group and do what they needed to do. But in if you were looking for an absolute ideal set of circumstances, he probably should have recognised Lutzau's fate a lot earlier and gotten over to another ship a lot faster. But, as I say, those are two very, very minor, in the grand scheme of things, mistakes in what otherwise was a very, very good set of command decisions. So, broadly speaking, he acquitted himself very well in the Battle of Jutland. Um, certainly far, far better than his counterpart. Now, when it comes to Shear, surprisingly enough, for for some, I actually think Shear did pretty much as good as could have been expected. Um, again, one or two slight errors in judgment but nothing that is m massively indicative of a failure as a commander, just a, a mistake that was made, and that's about it. The, again, as with Hipper, there'd probably be two mistakes that I would pick sheer up on. One, taking the pre-dreadnoughts with him, that 
probably didn't help too much. I mean, granted, the Nassaurs and Helgelands aren't massively faster, but it would have helped him keep his line a bit more closed up, might have helped him do a little bit more damage in a few places. Um, so, yeah, th there's a few minor improvements to the various encounters that might have occurred had the pre-dreadnoughts not been there, although arguably you could also say that perhaps uh, BT would have finally been able to inflict some serious damage on the German battle cruisers towards the start of the night action if the pre-dreadnoughts hadn't been there to interpose themselves between uh, the first scouting group and BT. So swings and roundabouts there, really. The other one is his after his first successful battle turn wait, which was a brilliant example of tactical command, he then turns and heads east and ends up running into the Grand Fleet a second time, which ends up inflicting considerably more damage on the High Seas Fleet. And that was probably an error of judgment. He, if given that he did not want to fight the high, the Grand Fleet in its full strength, he probably should have continued on his course either southwest or south rather than swinging hard east. Um, of course, quite where that would have left him come morning, etc., is a completely different question. But the German fleet really didn't need that second run through um, the Grand Fleet's gauntlets. But, those two minor errors aside, let's face it, Shear ended up taking an outnumbered and outgunned fleet into the teeth of the enemy at pretty much no moment's notice, given that the first indication that he had of the Grand Fleet's presence was when he saw the glittering fire on the horizon as the battle line opened up on him, and yet he still managed to successfully extricate his battle fleet from that encounter without any losses. And then even after he made that second um, run in with the Grand Fleet, he still managed to get his battle line out of there without any losses and then managed to get fight his way through the night action to safety without almost any losses to his capital ships. Obviously, they did lose per man, but... Eh. That's not exactly the world's greatest loss of compared to all the other ships he had under his command. And more importantly, all of the High Seas Fleet's dreadnoughts were still there and afloat at the end of the day. Granted, some of them were a bit worse for wear compared to what they had been when they'd set out. But he made a series of tactical choices and very trying circumstances with very limited options left to him. But through a combination of pre-engagement training and very rapid and con and con decisive decision making sheer managed to pull probably in like a 90th percentile outcome from a very bad situation as far as he was concerned so yeah again he did very very well in the battle um, as pretty much as much as you can realistically have expected him to do then, considering how close to the coast the major battles of the Western Front in World War I often were, was there ever the use of naval bombardment to break through the German lines in the north? Kind of, but largely not. The reason I say kind of is because right at the beginning of the war, when the Western Front was still stabilising, a somewhat scratch force of monitors and other small coastal ships served quite a vital role in slowing and stabilising the front line right on the Belgian coast, which probably helped um, the overall war, war effort quite considerably. However, by the time the line itself had actually stabilised, it had led to two things. One was the Germans started building considerable amounts of coastal defences, which prevented very close-in bombardment work. And secondly, there were an awful lot of targets to engage, not just the coastal defences themselves, occasionally, although the monitors would try to avoid that where possible, but also things like locks and canals for the Germans using for transport, the occasional railway dock facilities, factories, infrastructure, that kind of stuff. And that was generally considered to be a more of a vital um, target because obviously if you can say blow up a canal or the locks on a canal that's supplying the food and ammunition for a division that's going to do a lot more damage to German fighting capacity than throwing the same number of shells at that division where you might kill if you're lucky a few dozen or a few hundred men um, 
and on top of that because of these coastal defenses and everything it meant the actual range to which the shells could actually reach inland became somewhat more limited than it had been right at the beginning of the war so you could only maybe hit targets that were maybe up to 10 miles inland at maximum for most of the ships although obviously some ships like the one you can see here with its 18 inch gun could reach considerably further the other issue was accuracy because whilst at sea when you're firing at the enemy at extreme ranges having an accuracy spread of 500 to 700 yards at ranges of sort of a pushing 20 to 30 miles wasn't necessarily terrible um, because it's either miss or hit the ocean when you're firing inland at considerable ranges a spread of that kind of distance might mean all the difference between hitting the enemy's front line and your front line um, so direct naval bombardment on the german front lines unless they were right up against the coast was pretty much not going to happen um, but the monitor's role in trying to break through the german lines was there but it was in trying to mostly trying to take down the infrastructure and the and the supply lines that the those German troops would need either to conduct an offensive or to keep the defence up. Plus, of course, addressing more strictly naval targets like U-boat ports, etc. Admiral Tiberius asks, which civilians would you say have contributed the most to naval technology and development? There are quite a few civilians who have contributed vastly to naval technology and development. I mean, Parsons, the inventor of the steam turbine, would be one good example. And, well, whichever engineer working for Krupp developed Krupp Steel would be another good one to come up with. However, if I had to pick any individual one, and granted this may be showing something of my engineer bias, because he does show up an awful lot when you are doing an engineering degree, but I think perhaps that actually reflects his impact and just the vast scope of his legacy. I am going to vote for William Froud. He developed and formalised both practical testing and mathematical calculations for resistance in water and therefore speed, stability, hull form effects and so much else that completely revolutionised how ships could be designed to the point that if you look, for example, at two contemporary but very radical ironclads, the Caio Duilio class that the Italians built and the British response HMS Inflexible, Inflexible had a shorter but beamier hull, so more like a barge than a ship, which by most standard methods of design should have resulted in her being a considerably slower vessel unless you pumped ridiculous amounts of power into her but thanks to Froud's theories and calculations and water tank testing they were able to refine her hull form such that even though she had this natural disadvantage she actually had a similar speed to the Caio Duilio's which didn't benefit from that testing and his work basically has continued not entirely unchanged people were added to it but the core fun fundamentals of what he did are still the core fundamentals of hull design speed calculations and stability calculations for almost any kind of conventionally hulled ship right down to this day and so i don't think the impact that he made in this respect can be overstated because without his theories and his methods of working an awful lot of what we think of as the natural progression of ships from the 10 to 15 knot ironclads of the 1870s and 1880s to the 20, 20, 20 to 25 knot battleships and the 25 to 30 knot battle cruisers and then the 28 to 33 knot fast battleships etc simply wouldn't have been possible i um Maybe it would have been arrived at by trial and error. Maybe someone else would have invented some of his work eventually. But it would have followed a very different trajectory. And this underwater component of ship design often goes very underappreciated as compared to the topside 
things like guns and armour. So, yeah, if I had to pick any single one, I would have to go with William Froud. John Rees asks, was there more nuance to the Roman naval strategy to defeat the Carthaginians other than hybrid naval land warfare? Somewhat, but to a, to a greater extent, it was basically the Romans identifying what they did best and using that to their advantage. By the time of the Punic Wars, naval warfare in the Mediterranean had advanced a little bit over the Greco-Persian Wars. So in the Greco-Persian Wars, you had mostly biremes and triremes. By the time of the Punic Wars, quinqueremes were the order of the day, and as the name suggests, they were bigger, had more rowers per file of oars, and therefore were somewhat less agile um, than their predecessors. At which point, although ramming was still part of the naval arsenal of tactics, especially in terms of crippling your opponent so that you could bombard them with arrows or whatever, and then possibly also, if they were crippled, ramming them to finish them off, boarding actions had become much more common. And the Romans realised that with very little experience of their own at sea, the Carthaginians would be able to handle their ships better at sea. And handling your ships better meant that you would be more successful in pulling off things like ramming actions. Whereas the Romans realised that because they had, you know, legions and such like, their infantry were probably superior to the Carthaginian infantry and therefore in the boarding aspect of naval warfare they were more likely to come out ahead and so they effectively just tried to take as many steps as possible to emphasize the boarding part of the battles as opposed to the ramming and ship handling side of the battles which they knew that they would lose and by, by being able to force that boarding action to take place more and more and then taking advantage of that fact through a mixture of better heavy infantry as well as the famous Corvus then they're able to beat the Carthaginians far more often than the, Car than the Carthaginians can beat them so it it's not just a kind of we can't fight at sea we'll fight them except like it's a land battle there, it, there was a little bit more strategic and tactical thought that went into it but at the same time, it effectively was a, a hybrid of naval land warfare, just with a little bit more emphasis on the boarding action than had been previously the norm. Manani Wanderer asks, tell me more about the submarine with the two twin turrets you showed in the Washington Naval Treaty video. Yes, yeah, so this is HMS X-1. Um, it's a ship that will have its own five-minute guide at some point and probably will also have... A Wednesday video if not necessarily dedicated to it although possibly but certainly dedicated to the concept of the cruiser submarine um, and there we'll cover a lot more um, a lot more information about it in detail but effectively this was one of the earliest cruiser submarines the Germans really got there first with some designs for u-boat cruisers right towards the end of the Sec uh, First World War um, obviously later on you'd see things like Sir Kouf, which was the ultimate expression as built of a cruiser submarine there were various other designs the u.s navy came up with one that was even more heavily armed than circuf although it never put it into production x1 was a very interesting concept but broadly speaking not a particularly successful one um, like a lot of the submarine designs the royal navy came up with in the early 20s and late 1910s like the K-class, um, the M-class, etc. They looked good on paper, but tended to have some fairly major flaws. The K-class, for example, um, would have been absolutely fantastic and brilliant ships to, or boats to have around for about a three- to four-year period, after which they became hopelessly obsolete. The M-class, well, they were modified as the result of the washington treaty but they had some rather interesting concepts going on there was the submarine aircraft carrier attempt the giant mine layer attempt and of course the famous let's put a 12 inch gun on a submarine attempt <laughs> but x1 was designed specifically as a commerce raiding cruiser submarine so the idea was that in, if 
you came across an escorted convoy, which was now probably the likely to be the norm. Whereas positioning yourself at the relatively slow underwater speeds of a submarine to try and either navigate past or take out the escorts would take a considerable amount of time. Instead, X-1 was supposed to just pop up unexpectedly and engage the escorts with its twin 5.2-inch turrets. And hopefully it would have a considerably heavier armament than the majority of escorts it expected to meet. Combined with its surprise attack value, it should be able to rapidly destroy those escorts and then move in to take out the merchant ships using the much higher surface speed of the submarine, either with more gunfire or with the occasional torpedo. The main downside of X-1, as it turned out, was that rather being than being a submarine unto which we have attached guns, it kind of turned out to be a pair of gun turrets unto which we have attached a submarine. Um, the, the torpedo room was very cramped and meant that it would pretty much have to engage with its guns because it carried a very limited number of torpedoes and reloading was a pig, to say the least. So there'd be very limited number amounts of torpedoes that you could actually use. And the rest of the hull itself, because it had to take into account, you know, fairly extensive magazines and so forth, and the support mechanisms for the turrets, was generally also quite cramped, even though, as a submarine, it was a fairly substantial vessel of almost 3,000 tons surfaced and well over 3,000 tons displacement when it was submerged. Um, the power plant, the engine room, being similarly cramped and having all sorts of problems meant that it didn't have the world's most spectacularly successful career and ended up going from lay down launch commission and then scrapped all within the period of the interwar section which is a relatively unusual thing considering that not all but by far the most of the interwar submarines saw some kind of service in the second world war so Long John asks, what was the role of the navies in the Boxer Rebellion, of whatever country, and was it the norm for naval infantry to guard ports? Most of the defenders of Sing Tao in World War I, for example, were German marines. In terms of the Boxer Uprising, the navies, in as much as the ships, had relatively little to do with the main centrepiece of it, which was obviously the siege of the legations in Beijing. Well, basically because Beijing doesn't have a, a oceanic port, so it's a bit difficult for naval ships to get there. However, a surprisingly large contingent of the troops actually within the location at the time of the actual siege starting, and further a good chunk more of troops that were sent in to relieve it later on, were made up of various forms of naval infantry, marines, etc. So in as much as the navies provided a good proportion of the actual defensive troops and some of the relieving troops, they did play a fairly significant role on all sides of the various uh, alliance nations that went in to try and resolve the situation. As far as naval infantry guarding ports, it depends on, as with so many questions, the time, the place and the nation. Some nations had marine or naval infantry services that were far larger than others, and due to the nature of different nations, sometimes you would have a few ports relatively heavily built up close to home, at which point regular army garrisons are most likely. Other times you might have these ports scattered all over the place, all over the world perhaps in the case of a large empire and sometimes those might have army garrisons as well if they're part of a, a general much larger deployment of that nation's armed forces sometimes they might just have a small naval infantry or marine contingent and that might also be the case if your country is particularly geographically large like say russia um, if you've got a very remote port it could just be naval infantry or marines if it's a relatively small or isolated port that's mainly there for strategic purposes like some kind of coaling station or something or a watch station where rather than part of a colonial enterprise if you like so yeah it, it could vary quite dramatically 
um, and also dependent on the size of the nation and their relative importance in the grand scheme of things because again a nation that doesn't have a particularly large army or has reasons to concentrate as much of its army as it can in certain areas might delegate the guarding of distant ports to marines or naval infantry just for that reason even if they theoretically could deploy more regular land-based forces to defense and also navies tend to take a fairly active interest in the defense of their own kind of home ports so whilst that may have also a fairly significant army or land-based forces garrison you might find marine gunners or such like also interested with defending some parts of those ports and then we have was there any realistic chance in the 19th and 20th centuries of china developing a sufficiently powerful naval force to deter invasions technically yes but practically and politically almost no so china even in its rather uh, interesting shall we say state in this time in the time period still had a fair bit of money to hand and the reason why i say almost no in a practical sense or political sense is that they did almost manage it um once or twice I mean, you can see here for example this is one of their ironclads captured at the battle of the yalu river by the japanese at this point in the picture it's in japanese service but nonetheless and at the battle of yalu river the japanese came surprisingly close to losing to the point that, as i've said before if the chinese had gotten their ships fully crewed by trained and experienced crews with all the correct ammunition etc and um they'd listened to their leadership then there is every chance they could have won that battle which in turn would have meant they have seen off an invasion so that's a good deterrent so yeah china had the money certainly to build up a fleet that could deter most people it had the potential to build up an industry to build a fleet that could deter almost anybody and it certainly had the manpower uh, behind it but the more mundane political realities on the ground between you know weakening imperial control warlordism and needs to be said because of those uh in those internal weaknesses the rather predatory actions of various colonial powers it meant that practically china never had the unity to launch any kind of advancement or large unified effort to create a navy whether that be built from overseas and bought in partly built overseas and partly built at home or all bought, built at home look at japan for example and japan shows that actually it's entirely possible to take a state that is quite a long way technologically behind the other nations and catch up pretty quickly and china could have done exactly the same thing possibly faster possibly slower but certainly in a lot larger capacity on paper but the political reality said that they couldn't so yeah um realistic chance from a technical perspective certainly but from the more on the ground perspective mm, there was probably maybe one or two opportunities and they almost managed but not quite and that brings us to the end of this week's dry dock the only little bit of channel admin to do is to point out that the museum ship uss the sullivans is in a little bit of trouble article linked in the video description below so if you want to go and have a look at that and see what you can do if you desire to to give her a hand give her a help out um, and perhaps also spread the message to others then please please do so as you know i do have a rather of a soft spot for preserving museum ships understandably um, so that is the only channel admin for this week thank you very much and see you again in another video